All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode here. Today we have Chapter 4. So, we're going to briefly run through some of the colonies that we have not talked about uh, thus far, and then we will briefly compare and contrast some of the colonies that we were talking about, and then ultimately see how we get to that uh, moment of uh, feelings where revolution is relevant. Okay, so... Um, as mentioned before in the past, you can look through some of this stuff on your own, practice questions and whatnot. So let's start here with the middle colonies. The middle colonies, the only ones we haven't discussed just yet, we started with the Chesapeake, Southern, last time New England, now we're in the middle colonies. That's where we are, geographically speaking. That's New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. So we call these, as you can see there, it says middle colonies breadbasket. And the breadbasket of the colonies means this is where most of our grain is produced. And so um, that is really what the middle colonies are uh, going to be used for ultimately. And one characteristic of New York, Pennsylvania, and Jersey that it makes them a little bit different than the rest is, yes, yeah, so the breadbasket, but also that we are a very diverse group of people. Um, and I always use this analogy in class. I ask, well, if you go to New York City today, will you hear just one language? And if you've ever been to New York City walking around the streets, you're going to hear multiple languages. And that's true today. It goes all the way back to the beginning. Okay, we're a very diverse group of people here in New York. You're going to hear English during this time period. You're going to hear German, some Scots, okay, um, even possibly some French and Dutch. Uh, and that's, um, again, true today and even all the way back then. So we're always a very diverse place. Now, New York was originally called New Amsterdam. It was not the English who set up shop first. And the Dutch called it New Amsterdam. And the Dutch were not very successful. They were constantly getting attacked by the Native Americans. They uh, wound up selling the island of Manhattan to the English and eventually it will be called New York. Fun fact, uh, in Manhattan today, there is a street that you all probably have heard of called Wall Street. Wall Street is named because there used to be a wall on that street protecting the Dutch from the Native Americans. And the Native Americans, like I said, would constantly attack the Dutch. Um, hence, one of the reasons why they get out of there. Anyways, that's New York, diverse place. What about Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania is a very unique colony, uh, very similar to Rhode Island because as founded by William Penn, who was a Quaker, the Quakers and William Penn are going to allow for something that just like Rhode Island was very unique and that was complete religious freedom. Now, once again, we're always drawing these connections to what we have today and in our first amendment in the constitution, it does grant us the freedom of religion and we can give that thanks to good old William Penn and Anne Hutchinson and Roger Williams up in good old Rhode Island. What else makes Pennsylvania so unique besides freedom of religion? Women had greater rights uh, in Pennsylvania. They used to, the Quakers would pay Native Americans for their, for their land instead of just taking it. Wow, how radical of an idea. They also have a representative assembly. So Pennsylvania kind of has their own version of the Virginia House of Burgesses, okay? No, we don't have a fancy name for it, but they did have a representative assembly, basically like a mini Congress. So Pennsylvania was a very radical, very different, very unique colony for all of those reasons. All three of these little colonies, New York, Pennsylvania, and Jersey, like I said, were demographically, religiously, and ethnically diverse, and this is the breadbasket of the colonies, okay? So make sure you know that. Colonial policy, when speaking about the colonies as a whole, at least in the New England and Middle Region, the colonies existed to enrich the mother country, right? England didn't necessarily care about the 13 colonies. They cared only about the amount of money they can make off of these colonies. And so they didn't really care too much about them. They said, hey, you know what? You guys can kind of do what you're going to do as long as we're making money. This period is called solitary neglect. When you're neglected, you're not being paid attention to. And just like leaving a little kid at home with a pack of crayons, they're probably going to draw all over the walls. And that's exactly what the colonists were doing. No, not drawing on the walls of their houses. They were making money. They were smuggling. They were breaking the rules. What kind of rules? Just like the Navigation Acts. 
The Navigation Act said that the colonies could only trade with England, and the colonists said, you know what, we're going to do our own thing, no one's looking, we're going to trade with the French, for example, and the Dutch, etc. And as long as we can get away with it, we're going to continue to do so. And so this happened for a long time. The colonies were um, breaking the Navigation Acts, okay, these rules. Now, this comes to an end in 1686 with Sir Edmund Andros, who was appointed by the king to make more money for the crown. And he says, you know what, how do I make more money? Well, I should implement these Navigation Acts. I know the colonists are smuggling. This is an open... Um, an open thing that everybody knows about. And so he's going to try to enforce these navigation acts and he tries to take away the town hall meetings. The colonists are not too happy. So you think, wait, why don't we have the American Revolution in 1686 then? Why is it only about 90 years later we have the American Revolution? Well, the Glorious Revolution, if you remember, and this is also one of your vocabulary terms, the Glorious Revolution, William and Mary come to the throne and over in England, that is, and they relax all of this. They say, you know what, let's go back to solitary neglect. Um, and they kind of uh, revisit, we revisit this solitary neglect period and things go back to the way they were. The colonists are now happy again and everybody can rest easy. Okay, so we do not have the American Revolution just yet, but you could see things were starting to heat up and the Glorious Revolution calms that all down. Okay, so we've finished talking about all the colonies now, some more than others, um, but the exam in May really likes to focus on a couple of main themes. Now, one of the main things that they do like to ask specifically on a short answer question is what are the differences or the similarities between the various regions of colonies? What kind of people came? Why did they come? And what were the differences in the environment and how they made their money? So just quickly reviewing um, kind of some of the themes that we talked about here in some of the areas. Uh, the New England colonies, remember that there was mostly families. They had a very important uh, view on religion. You had to be part of religion, be part of town hall meetings. They made their money various ways through shipbuilding trade and a little agriculture that's a little different down the south. They made their money off the plantation system. There were far less cities. There was mostly single males coming to the south in Chesapeake. It was mostly cash crop economies, tobacco, sugar, rice, uh, and then much later on you have cotton, but we'll get there. We talked about how we go from indentured servitude to slavery after Bacon's Rebellion. There's many reasons as to why we should go to slavery, because indentured servants are outliving their contracts, because most of them were behind Bacon and his rebellion. They didn't want them to rise up. Okay, and uh, those were good reasons that we see more slaves uh, start to come about after Bacon's rebellion. Speaking of slavery, you do remember some of this from last year, the triangular trade, okay, that uh, these uh, African slaves are coming over from um the far point in the right triangle there okay that'd be africa uh, coming to the new world and what's going back to europe is the finished product or i'm sorry the raw goods that can be made back into a finished product over in the factories in europe um you see at the bottom of the slide there the stono uprising this was also a vocabulary term the stono uprising in south carolina these were slaves that tried to run away and they try to make it to Spanish Florida. Uh, remember, the Spanish had Florida, and the Spanish had outlawed slavery by this time. So if they made it to Florida, they're free. They did not work, um, and it, it's unsuccessful for them. The reason we talk about the Stono Uprising is that it is unsuccessful and the result of it. Okay, And the result is we see stricter slave codes. Uh, enacted by the slave owners on slaves. Were there other ways that slaves could try to resist slavery besides running away? Yes, 
fake an illness, break the machinery, work really slow. Those are other ways to get about um, running away from slavery. Now, speaking about religion, uh, religion, as we know, is very important to the New England colonies in particular. We do see over the course of time people becoming, quote unquote, less religious, and that's what leads to the halfway covenant. The halfway covenant says, well, yes, okay, religion is still important, but we realize not everybody's as into religion as they used to be. So you could become what they call a partial church member and still be part of the town hall meetings. Because remember, in order to be part of the government, you had to be part of the church. This says you could be a quote unquote partial member. So that's a relaxing of the uh, rules there with the halfway covenant. Um, we talked about the three areas we saw laws of religious freedom. The first was Maryland, but remember the act of toleration was only for Christians. Rhode Island with Anne Hutchinson and Roger Williams, they allowed complete religious freedom. That was the first time we saw that. And then recently today in this lecture, we saw William Penn and the Quakers over in Pennsylvania. They allowed complete religious freedom. So do remember that. That's very important that you know those three examples. In 1692, we have something kind of weird that happens, and you've probably heard about this before. You might even learn about it in English this year, and that is the Salem Witch Trials. The Salem Witch Trials was a kind of, like I said, weird event that goes down in Salem, Massachusetts. People are uh, accused of being witches because ultimately people, like I said before, were losing their religion. They were less religious and kind of um blaming people for things that were happening and it becomes what we call a witch hunt and that's literally from this you just have people start accusing others of being something that they are not and the hysteria grows and grows and grows and as we all know gossip and hysteria can grow very fast and multiple people were put to death that's up to you if you want to believe that they were witches or not i'm not going to tell you they were or not but um Ultimately, people were put to death because they were believed in being witches. Now, people are losing their religion. Well, that's what leads to the Great Awakening. Okay, this is a religious revival in the 1730s and 40s. This is the first Great Awakening, and I was very um, particular about correcting your definitions on John Edwards and George Whitefield. Um, there's multiple Great Awakenings. I think there's about six in our country's history. We're only going to talk about the first two, but please be aware that this is a first great awakening um, just so you know for your definitions and also to differentiate between the second great awakening that we'll talk about in a couple of chapters so anyways religious revival john edwards one of your vocabulary terms what do we need to know about him he is a guy that's basically trying to scare everybody into being more religious again he writes a sermon called sinners in the hands of an angry god where he says you know what god is angry with everybody because they're losing their religion and we must become more religious. We have to get more people back into this thing. Otherwise we're doomed. Now, George Whitefield, okay, he gets more people into religion because he has a more energized style of preaching and basically is not boring to go see one of his sermons, one of his um, sermons on the frontier uh, because he is way more energized and has more um, going on in his sermons than as opposed to John Edwards, who is, uh, for lack of better words, boring to go see, if you will. The people that support all of this are called the new lights and the old lights are the people that are not so into this. Remember, we talked about religion and in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and Harvard was founded on religion, believe it or not. Well, so is Dartmouth and Pr Princeton and Brown, some of these Ivy League schools that are promoting and training ministers. So interesting to think about some of these schools got their start um, having to do with the church. But as we also know that there is a lot of people calling for the separation of church and state, and we will see that eventually as we get closer to our American Revolution. But this is the first mass movement shared by all the colonies. So we talked about their differences, their you know economies, their environments, the people that came. What are some similarities? Well, this is one similarity that we see the Great Awakening in all 13 of these colonies. What's the other big similarity is that they all do have some form of agriculture in their economy. Maybe Massachusetts doesn't make their money off of agriculture all year long, but they do have agriculture 
part-time throughout the year. Okay, so that leads us now to mercantilism. As we talked about before, mercantilism means that the colonies exist for the benefit of the mother country, our mother country being England. So, so far we mentioned the Navigation Acts. There's going to be multiple uh, laws that we must follow in order to obey um, you know, the English and being their colonies. And we've talked about solitary neglect, how things kind of went back to normal after the Glorious Revolution, and we're experiencing this relative nice time period where we can kind of do whatever we want and ignore the rules as long as we're making money for England. Um, the good things about mercantilism is that we are developing an economy in New England for shipbuilding. We're protected by the British military. And the English have this monopoly on our tobacco here in the southern and Chesapeake areas. The bad things about mercantilism for us is it restricts our manufacturing, that we have to send our stuff back to England in order to be manufactured into goods. Uh, we don't have a lot of factories here just yet. We are going to have to pay a high price for English goods. We do not have the liberty of you know, shopping around and getting the best price. And also farmers have to accept whatever price that they're given from England because we are only allowed to trade with them. So you will see mercantilism become something that the colonists are not too happy about. We mentioned the impact of the Glorious Revolution, the Dominion, Dominion of New England, etc. All of this solitary neglect is ultimately going to come to an end, though, with the Seven Years' War, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, okay, that French and Indian War. Colonial politics, we talked about the Mayflower Compact, Town Hall Meeting, the House of Burgesses, the elected representative assemblies in Pennsylvania. You have to know these examples. These are all stepping stones for how we get to where we are today. How do we get to representative government? These are the stepping stones. You must know that. The last thing on this uh, slide is called the Zanger case. John Peter Zanger, he is a writer. He uh, writes up this article in the, New, the um, New York Journal, and it talks about the governor of New York, William Cosby, um, where he criticizes him and calls him out, and he says some things about him, and the governor says, you can't write that. That's, that's illegal. You can't do this, and he sues him. Uh, well, the courts wind up saying, actually, John Peter Zenger is allowed to do so, as long as the statements were true, and in this case, they were. So why do I bring this up? What's the importance of this case? What it's doing is setting the precedent for freedom of the press, another one of our First Amendment rights that, that is protected today in the Bill of Rights. So again, we're always talking about precedents. Where do we get what we have today from, uh, whether it's representative government or freedom of religion, or in this case, with the Zenger case, freedom of the press. Okay, closing out some of the stuff we're talking about in these 13 colonies is the economic diversity of the colonies. We mentioned this. How do they make their money in all these different places? You must know. What is it shipbuilding? Is it agriculture? Is it commerce? Okay, is it, uh, you know, wheat? Okay, you must know. Ethnic diversity, what kind of people do we have? You know, we have slaves in the Deep South. We have Scots Irishmen on the frontier or up in the middle area. Um, we have the Puritans up in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. You must know the diversity of the colonies, and we know the most diverse place of the colonies is right here in the middle of the colonies. That would be good old New York.
Okay, so let's fill in some of the gaps here, what we have left with the um, getting up to that revolutionary era. So now that we've talked about the colonies, talked about similar themes, let's talk about um, some of the different uh, empires that settle in the New World and how we get to ultimately the end of the French Indian War and why that impacts this revolutionary era. So we've talked about this before. We talked about the English colonies, where they settle, why they settle. We've mentioned the French briefly. You can see on the map there all that blue territory is the French, their founding father, if you will, of this New World exploration is Samuel de Champlain. And a lot of the French are coming here for economic motives, fur trading with the Native Americans. And you're also going to see um, missionaries trying to convert the Native Americans. We mentioned the Dutch over in New Amsterdam and New York and how they wind up giving up uh, also because of some troubles with the Native Americans. We mentioned in the very beginning, uh, back in our first lecture, the Spanish, uh, where they go out. And you can see that orange area on the map where the Spanish are colonizing and how um, you know their relationship with the natives gets better after Poppy's rebellion. This is also a great short answer question by the exam. They love to know and want to hear from you as to what are the similarities and differences between the colonial empires that settle in the area. You know, what kind of people come? Why did they come? What's their uh, relationship with the Native Americans? And, um, you know, was there intermarriage between the various empires and the Native Americans? Um, this is, I wouldn't really be concerned about this, so I'm briefly just going to say all three of these wars were European wars that spilled over in the Americas. That's about it. You'll never see a question about this on an AP U.S. history exam on world. That's a different story. Uh, we talked about solitary neglect and how uh, we are really left to do whatever we want to do for the most part, and we break those laws, those navigation acts, for example. How do things heat up? How do we ultimately get to that French Indian War? Things are heating up. Colonists, and um, it's in our DNA as Americans, uh, all the way back to the beginning here, that we want to push westward. We want to explore the frontier and see more land. We call this manifest destiny. And you we typically will not talk about manifest destiny until uh, you know a long time from now, a couple months. But... Manifest destiny is actually something that happens all the way in the beginning here, back when we're just colonists. So it's a theme all year we'll be talking about. So although this isn't called or identified as manifest destiny just yet, we as colonists, we want to push past the boundaries and go west. The problem is with going west, two problems. There's two different peoples out there. One, there's Native Americans. And two, we saw before on the map that blue area was controlled by the French. So this is going to cause some conflict. And as we as colonists push past, the, past those Appalachian Mountains, we run into that conflict and we see the French. The French are trying to prevent these colonists from uh, heading out here to the frontier. They start building these little forts to prevent us uh, from heading out there. And the Native Americans are not too happy, obviously, as well. Things start to go down when a young Virginian named George Washington, he winds up being put in control of command of the British troops to fight against uh, the French here. Because as I said, things start to heat up with the two forts, the multiple forts, two sides, I should say, that are being built. You can see in this map on the right here, all the little forts that are being built, the British are in the red, the French are in the blue and things start to boil over and eventually fighting starts to go down. Okay, so you don't really have to be concerned with all the battles that are going to go down between the French and the British here. Although it's called the French Indian War, believe it or not, it's really the French Indians versus the British. Remember, we are going to take the side of the British in this war. Don't concern yourself with the battles. We're always 
concerned about causes and effects. So he saw the causes of the French Indian War because we're pushing into that territory that's not ours. Well, let's talk about the effects. So on these maps, on the left, you see before the French Indian War, that tealish color in the middle was the French territory. But then you look on the right side of the map here, and that's after the French Indian War. And you can see that the French are virtually removed from the entire New World. They don't really have much territory left um, in this New World. So big effects here, and a big war, and a very expensive war, as we'll see what happens with that in a second. But before I get to the cost, some more effects. Something that goes on during the war, and I asked you about this in your homework over the summer, is there's something called the Albany Plan. And Ben Franklin, that's his grave there on the bottom right-hand side of the slide, he wants to get the colonists on the same page, and he attempts to get us all together with his Albany plan. So he has seven colonies. They meet in Albany, makes sense, in 1754. The purpose was to get us um, on the same page and also get some of the Iroquois nation, believe it or not, to join on the side of the British. Problem is, although this sounds all nice in paper and a nice idea, and you would think, oh, we're all on the same side, it doesn't work. Our first attempt at trying to get the colonies on the same page was unsuccessful. Now, this is going to come up again when we start talking about the road to the revolution and trying to get all 13 colonies on the same page. Here, only seven met, and they weren't even on the same page. So how are we going to get 13 on the same page when it comes time for 1776? Well, we'll come back to that, obviously, later on. But what this shows us is that the 13 colonies are 13 very different places. They're almost like 13 individual nations and not colonies of the same country. So the Albany plan by Ben Franklin, the, the goal was to get us on the same page and it failed, does not happen, um, which is unfortunate for Ben Franklin and fortunate for us. Okay, we're going to fast forward through some of this stuff here. You can take a look at this on your own, some of the individual statistics and whatnot about the French Indian War. Um, like I said, you don't really have to be too concerned about this. But the Treaty of Paris of 1763 ends the French and Indian War. I would know that because there are three Treaty of Parises. Um, so there's one, the Treaty of Paris, 1763, ends the French and Indian War. Um, in Chapter 6, we'll talk about the 1783 Treaty of Paris, and that's the end of the American Revolution. And then a while from now, Chapter 19 or 20, uh, we'll talk about the Treaty of Paris of 1898 that ends the Spanish-American War. So be aware of the years. If you want to sound smart, you definitely want to throw in the year there. So I would know that. All right. So what do we get out of this war? We win. Um, you know, we're on the winning side, I should say. England gains Florida from Spain temporarily. Um, we also are, well, I shouldn't say we, but England gains control of Canada and also from the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River. Again, those that map before showed us all the territory that was gained. So you would think, okay, that's awesome. We're on the winning side. Now we can head out west. You know, we can expand. We can fulfill our whole manifest destiny um, ideology, if you will. And eh, not really, because England has to pay for this war, and war is very expensive. And so England says, we're going to make the colonists pay for this war because they're the ones that really started it. So they're going to start to impose a lot of taxes, and those taxes will come up in Chapter 5 uh, as we start talking about the American Revolution. So in 1763, essentially a line is drawn in the sand. That red line there is supposed to outline where the colonists cannot go past. We're not allowed to go out there. That's called the Proclamation of 1763. They said, no, no, colonists, you can't do this whole Manifest Destiny stuff. You can't head out there. You're not allowed. And the colonists, they're not too happy about that. Okay, so you can see things starting to heat up between us and the British. Uh, one of the last things to talk about here um, in 1763, which is also the same year that this war ends, you're going to see Pontiac, who is an Ottawa chief. He is trying to get together some Native Americans and trying to get them to band together against the uh, colonists, okay, because of their, you know, expansion, exploiting them and heading out into their land. Well, the colonists take matters into their own hands, and you're going to see this in the form of what's called the Paxton Boys, a group of 
uh, militiamen with basically these Scots Irishmen with guns, and they go out and try and they attack the um, Native Americans, the Pontiac and the Ottawas. Um, so this is you know in, increasing tensions between us, the colonists, and the Native Americans, and so that proclamation line is drawn. Okay, after Pontiac's rebellion. Okay, and like I said, the name of that line is called the Proclamation of 1763. Okay, so at the top of the slide there, there's your line, the Proclamation line of 1763. On the map, it's that green line there. It's essentially the Appalachian Mountains. We're not allowed to go past it. Okay, that's the law, that's the rule, can't go past it. Well, that's one of the things that's going to start to tick us off. Okay, couple that with taxes. And we're going to have ourselves a nice revolution coming up shortly. All right, finishing off this chapter, the British view versus the colonist view. After the French Indian War, the British were disappointed in us. They felt that we started the war. They thought that we were pretty helpless, that we would have lost if it weren't for them, which is true. Um, they feel that we should pay for the war and that we should assume, um, you know, they should assume direct control over us like we're children. The colonists were, you know, saying, hey, listen, we may have started this war. We certainly helped in the war. If it weren't for us, you certainly wouldn't have won either. Um, we do not think we should pay for the war. We're supposed to be protected by the British. That's why we pay taxes to them. Uh, we certainly felt uh, a little alienated from all this. And we certainly wanted to move past the Appalachian Mountains. We didn't like that proclamation line of 1763. So main idea here, things are heating up. Things are getting crazy, and we're going to head to that American Revolution in the next chapter. All right. Uh, hopefully this was helpful. Um, next time, like I said, we'll get into some more stuff about American Revolution and that Declaration of Independence. If you felt this helped, give it a like or subscribe. Other than that, peace out.